Okay. We are, well, let me say we, um, I'm going to say I'm continuing to think about this whole idea of how to uh, talk to or speak to Protestants. Um, what I've seen basically is that when Protestants are talking about Orthodox theology, they don't understand the underrooting or the, the uh, foundational issue, um, which is divine simplicity. Now, I've talked about this previously, but what simplicity means is that God is not composed of parts. Okay, that's what we mean by simple. Not that God is simple, but that he's not, he doesn't have composition. And I've discussed kind of briefly on this issue about, you know, the differences between Eastern and Western conceptions of the Trinity. When I see Protestants talking, because Matt Whitman, um, who, you know, used to do the 10-minute Bible hour or whatever, just put up a video talking about the Great Schism of 1054 with a, a scholar, I guess Dr. Something Something, I don't know the guy's name, but this guy fired off the typical Protestant, you know, uh, response that I typically see is that the filioque wasn't really over anything important. It was just a cultural difference and it had more to do with authority, you know, the rejection of papal authority by the East than it did with any real theological uh, issue. And in fact, most of the times, nine times out of ten, um, probably higher than that, 90, 99% of the time, that's probably too high, 90% of the time the Protestants will agree with the Filioque. And of course, they, they've accepted it, like they accept the Filioque. Uh, in case you don't know what that is, Filioque is an addition to the Creed, where it says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. The uh, Western Church added, and the Son. Now this issue really didn't kind of fully solidify itself until you get further ecumenical councils or attempted ecumenical councils that failed. Okay, they, they were reunion councils that were ultimately rejected by the East. Um, the Council of Lyon or Lyon, you know, Lyon, I think is how it's pronounced, L-Y-O-N-S. And then the other council was the Council of Florence. Now, Florence was pretty much the issue that led to, like, permanent split. There's, there's no rectifying it. You can't come back together. And I've heard Roman Catholic apologists try to explain, like, how you can interpret that correctly but they dog they dogmatized their belief and you can go and you can read the ruling from Florence and see that what they actually say is that there's one spiration of the spirit uh, from the father and son together as from one principle which is just crazy to, because what you actually have is like the father and the son uh, as like one entity spirating another person which ultimately re results in subordination of the spirit. Um, we're talking about really deep metaphysical issues here. And uh, unfortunately, I just don't think that majority of Protestants have the undergirding or the framework to understand these things. I mean, if, this is one of the things that led me out of Protestantism was... The number of people that you will encounter at a Protestant church that uh, are just proclaiming all kinds of heretical ideas, whether they be uh, Arian, believing that the Son is the first created being, um, 
rejecting the personhood of the Holy Spirit, thinking that he's just a force. And I'm talking about mainline denominations, like running into people at church and they'll have all these heretical ideas and ultimately realizing that a lot of Protestantism, um, at least in the circles that I was running in, is just full of all kinds of you know, heretical ideas concerning the Trinity. But to get into the deeper issue of conversing with Protestants is something that's really, it's hard to, it's hard to deal with these uh, objections that they have to the faith because there's been a whole lot of, for some reason I've just noticed there's been a lot of content being put out, anti-Orthodox content, you know, polemic content against orthodoxy by Protestants. And it's it's probably in a response to, in my estimation, probably the effectual uh, evangelizing that these churches are probably losing members to the Orthodox Church, which I think is a good thing. But they want to get into these arguments and debates and they, they come from the position of the five solas you know, sola scriptura, uh, Bible alone, uh, sola fide, faith alone, uh, solo Christus, Christ alone, um, solo gratia, grace alone, and then solo de gloria, for the glory of God alone. So, specifically what I want to talk about is the issue of justification. Because when there's a lot of noise outside, gang. I'm I'm sorry if my mic's picking this up. I live right next to a uh, food place here, and it's open, and there's people going in to get donuts and whatnot. So, and I'm right next to the road. But uh, specifically, these issues when you start talking to Protestants, they immediately want to bring up these objections to orthodoxy based upon veneration of saints, prayers to saints, um, icons, and sacraments. They reject sacramentology. At least a lot of the, the, you know, a lot of people that come from, unless you're like a high church, you know, if you're like from like Anglican, excuse me, or like some Lutheran groups, uh, like Missouri Synod Lutherans, you know. But even now, look at what's happening in Anglicanism. I mean, and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to, like, point out, like, all this stuff, but it, it's, it's all this division. And it's all this, I hear all these attacks against orthodoxy about justification. And it's really all a simplicity issue. It all goes back to divine simplicity. If you want to look at the West and why it's in chaos and why everything is disintegrating and why everybody's going into deconstruction and weird heretical, um, you know, Judaizing sects of of schismatic groups like uh, Hebrew roots or Messianic Judaism, you know. Uh, all this weird stuff with people trying to mix together Old Testament customs and you've got all these divisions between Arminians and everything else. It all stems from divine simplicity, all of it. And essentially, when Protestants are discussing filioque, they don't even see how this is related to the issue of simplicity. When you're talking about the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and they'll say Father and the Son and how that already is causing a huge shift in simplicity because they're confusing as I said the economic procession of the Spirit in time and space you know the sending of the Spirit from the Son with the procession from the hypostasis of the Father so once you've lost the distinctions between these categories, you're already on bad footing. And 
this is a lot of like why we have the ecumenical councils is to you know the starting point for orthodox theology is Christology answering the question who do you say that I am which we only know about the you know the trinity from the son from what Christ has revealed to us in fact we sing it in our liturgy um, in uh, orthros or matins on Sunday morning you know when I when I go in uh, God is the Lord and hath appeared unto us blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord so it's this whole the revelation through the incarnation and ultimately this whole idea of essence and energies of God and you can see it clearly laid out in scripture if you go for instance to 1st Corinthians um, chapter 12 where uh, the Apostle Paul is talking about the the operations of the Spirit the working of the Spirit so here you see uh, chapter 12 of 1st Corinthians he says now concerning spiritual gifts brethren I would not have you ignorant you know that you are Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols even as you were led wherefore I give you under give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost now there are diversities of gifts so these are the charismatic giftings but the same spirit there are differences of administrations but the same Lord and there are diversities of operations and here the word operations if you look in the Greek it's inner gamaton and it says uh, but it's the same God which worketh and the word there that's worketh is energon this is where the word we get the word energy okay but the same God which worketh all in all but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom he's talking about diversity of of gifts now uh, wisdom to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit to another the working so here we have it again and this word translated working is inner gamata if you were to read it in the Greek of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues so we could go on we could look at this the word inner inner uh, inner gamantan we have the word Ergon in the scripture, we have the word energo. If you look in the Greek, energo, this is where we get uh, energy. You can find energo, ener, energio, that word in Matthew 14, 2, Mark 6, 14, Romans 7, 5, 1 Corinthians 12, 6, 2 Corinthians 12, 11, 2 Corinthians 4, 12, Galatians 2, 8, Galatians 3, 5, Galatians 5, 6, Ephesians 1, 11. Ephesians 1.20, Ephesians 2.2, 2, Ephesians 3.20, Philippians 2.13, Colossians 1.29, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, 2 Thessalonians 2.7, and James 5.16. So uh, this word energio and all of its other uh, related word group family like energometon, um, ergon, uh, they're all kind of lost when you go into the English translations and it was something that was lost in Latin and Dr. David Bradshaw who is a Orthodox um, you know, scholar has done a lot of work on this issue so for instance look in Colossians uh, 1 um, 29 here it says <clears throat> uh, let's see, let's start in verse uh, 20, 28. So it says, um, actually, let me start back. Let me read a little bit of this. 
he says, We'll just start here in verse 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settle, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. This is Colossians uh, 1, uh, 23. He says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you've heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake which is the church whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to the working, and the word there would be energy, um, Energio, which worketh. So if you were to translate that, it would be like, worketh in me mightily. So the, the energy that is energizing in me mightily would be a more appropriate uh, translation. If you go down to verse 12 of Colossians 2.12, it says that, um, let's go down here to, <clears throat> verse uh, Colossians 2 um, 8 beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain to see after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ so there is a clear distinction between traditions of men and apostolic tradition okay Paul actually tells us in other places to follow the traditions uh, that he's left for you so he says for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily he's talking about Christ and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This is talking about baptism, circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. Uh, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, where are you arisen with him through the faith of the, and it says operation. The word here is energy. You look in the Greek. Look here. Look it up. Go to a a uh, interlinear translation and look it up in the Greek. Colossians two, twelve. The faith of the energy of God who hath raised him from the dead. So in verse thirteen, he says, "You being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, he hath quickened together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses." trespasses so you're made alive with him because it's his energy in you right so if you go back to first corinthians 3 9 and this is going to make the uh calvinist head spin here because they they're all um monergist believing that god just does everything and they are so opposed to synergy any talk of synergy they'll just label pelagian and say that you're a pelagiast heretic and uh that you're wrong so if you see here about paul talking in first corinthians chapter three he said um verse 6 3 6 he says i have planted apollos watered but god gave the increase he's talking about the gospel he says so then neither is he that planteth anything neither he that watereth but god that giveth the increase now he that planteth he that watereth are one and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor he says for we are laborers Okay, together with God. Now, if you look this up, co-laborers, it's synergos. 
synergos, uh, synergos, synergy, synergistic, meaning you are working with God or God is working in you. You are God's husbandry, you are God's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me. I just, you know, this is the thing. When you're talking about deeds, if you look at John, uh, St. John's Gospel, uh, you can go over there to John um, 2, 31, and it says, or not 2, 31, but John 3, 21. John 3, 21. <clears throat> So this is Jesus speaking. Okay, go to verse uh, John uh, 3.20. He says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. So we're talking about works. The words here is ergon. So it's... That they're wrought in God. So is it the work of God in you that's producing the works? Is it synergistic? Because what it is, is this God working in you, right? And you can go back to that verse that we read in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, where uh, Paul calls himself, uh, you know, a synergos, uh, a synergos, a co-laborer with God, that it's you know, the other place where he says, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ that lives in me. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that liveth, but he that lives in me. This is what he was talking about in, in uh, that verse we read in Colossians here previously. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's this union, union with Christ. So we got to get away from this idea of legal um, juridical language and think more of salvation not in terms of a of a court of law although there is a sense in which that's true but you can't put what 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 has happened in the west is all these um, this through that propositions so they're, they want to make everything an extreme position. So let me give you an example. We talk about, you know, when J Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, you must be born again of water and spirit. And, you know, somebody from the Orthodox Church would say to a Protestant from, you know, like a low Protestant church, meaning they're not sacramental, uh, that you, get, you receive the spirit in baptism, right? You must be born of water and spirit. And they'll say, no, that has nothing to do with baptism. That has to do with the spirit. So they want this. They don't want any sacramentality. This all goes back to the simplicity issue. I don't even know if you, if you can understand what I'm talking about when we're talking about essence and energies. So I'd recommend to you to uh, go find some of the talks you just google just just go to youtube and type in dr david bradshaw okay and look up um i guess gregory palamas Pal I, I mean i know that if you look for instance jay dyer talked to uh dr david bradshaw and dr david bradshaw has also been on gospel simplicity with Austin Suggs. So I would recommend either one of those two talks as an introductory thing to this issue of the essence and energies. Um, the point being is, is that when we're talking to Protestants, we can't, they want to jump directly to icons. That's what I'm talking about. They want to talk about prayers to saints, prayers, uh, you know, they want to talk about sacraments, they want to talk about the Eucharist. They want to talk about iconography and, and say, I got a problem with that. The real issue here is that our view of simplicity is completely different. Completely different. The West has lost this whole idea of, of the energies of God. And so 
they like you have this whole problem with how does God interact with the world that we're living in because if he's so transcendent and you know above the earth and everything and that we as as um, human beings cannot partake of God's essence or we would become God in other words it would result in apotheosis we would be like melded into the Godhead like some sort of pagan you know, religion where we all just become like one with the universe, man. Like everything is God and God is everything. This is precisely why the Orthodox Church looks at this issue of energies, looks at, you know, passages where, for instance, in Second uh, Peter where it talks about being partakers of the divine nature and says this is how we can partake of God without becoming God, that we participate in God's glory, um, as Jesus prays in John 17, his high priestly prayer, he prays that we would have the same glory that he has. Now, we would say that the glory of God is divine energy, that it's uncreated glory. But because of this transcendence and the loss of this concept of energies in the uh, Western mindset, then you all have to have what exactly is glory, you know, what exactly is grace. This is why the other day when I was watching Anthony Rogers debate Seraphim Hamilton on the issue of justification, um, they're just talking past each other. Because when Seraphim Hamilton uses the word grace, he's talking about an energy of God you know, that you can participate in. That you're literally participating in one of the divine energies, uncreated grace. Whereas when Anthony Rogers is talking about grace, he's talking about a thing. Like unmerited favor, as the Protestants would say. Like, like, like grace is a thing that God dispenses to you from like a Pez dispenser or something. It's like something that God, you know, here you go, here's your grace. Um, same thing with all this idea of legal justification. As if, as if, uh, it's some legal contract that God signs, you know, here you go, here's your contract. Um, we view it more in the terms of union with God. Like, I'm married to my wife, right? Here's my wedding ring. This is a symbol of my marriage. We're married. We're living in a covenant with each other, a sacramental uh, marriage, right? Where we are working out our faith together, living in union with another, one another, Okay, that's more of the way that we view our status with God. Now, if I was to uh, leave my wife, we would no longer be in union with each other. Our our marriage would become, you know, uh, we'd be separated, and I would go out and I'd be, you know, living my life. And this is why all over in the Bible, God calls people that. Um, that go to other gods. He calls them fornicators. He likens serving other deities to uh, whoredom. So, yeah, I've gone on long enough. I don't know what else to say. It's just a real dilemma. It's a problem that I've noticed when I'm talking to people that we, they want to talk about Z. You know, they want to talk about X, Y, and Z. They want to talk about stuff from like the seventh ecumenical council and beyond and uh we haven't even gotten to the fundamentals because there was a shift between the east and the west and it was more than just cultural differences and it was real theologically deep metaphysical issues where there's been this complete and total um, loss of distinctions and categories in western theology which has really led to a deformed ecclesiology. And you can see what's happening to Rome now. You know, it's taken a long time for it to manifest itself, but uh, I believe Eastern Orthodox position is being proved outright because um, you see all the weird stuff going on post-Vatican II, clown masses and, you know, the, these uh, Pope going down to South America with the Pachumama ceremony and all this weird pagan gobbledygook going on. I mean, this is all a result of 
uh, getting your foundation of your everything that's built on top of it. If the foundation is bad, everything built on top of it's gonna go bad too. So, Christology, triadology, you get those wrong, and everything else that follows is gonna be a mess. <laughs>